Corn School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by BASF and Pride Seeds. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin. Welcome to the Corn School. Today I'm at Southwest Diagnostic Days, Ridgetown College, University of Guelph, catching up with Jocelyn Smith from the university. Jocelyn, how's it going? Pretty good, thanks, Bert. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. Um, I want to talk about European corn borer. Now, Tracy Bowdy, Omafra's entomologist, was at this presentation yesterday and said, this topic has not been on this agenda since 1997. Mm -hmm. Now, I thought we had this bug beat, but it's made a comeback. What, what's happening? Yeah, it's true. The European corn borer control story with BT corn has been one of the biggest successes we've had with transgenic corn. And it was 1996 when these products first came to the market. And here we are 25-ish years later, and it's been, we haven't had any cases of resistance in, in the world, you know, where all these BT crops are grown, which is primarily North America and a couple spots in Europe. Mm. Um, but until, unfortunately, we found our first case of BT resistance with this pest in 2018 in Nova Scotia, of all mm. places. Now, talk about resistance. Um, 2018, you said, but that's spreading across the country, right? Well, it's it may be spreading somewhat already. Yes, we've we've since we found that first um, that first resistance case around Truro, Nova Scotia, and it was to the Cry One F protein in, uh, that's expressed in some BT corn plants. Uh, commonly, we were calling it uh, Herculex One. That was the trait the trade name for that trait. That was our initial detection, and since we found that, we really ramped up our monitoring for resistance for corn borer across Canada, and we've since picked up uh, some other resistant populations near Montreal, Quebec, and one near Carmen, Manitoba as well. So I think there's more maybe out there than we thought, but there, there are some circumstances that might have contributed mm -hmm. to why those places are, are where we're finding them. Let's talk about resistance and why we're seeing it. What's happening there with the traits no longer being effective? Right. So, yes, when we got this call in 2018, I went out to that area in the fall, around the beginning of September, and I went into four or five different Cry1F fields, though they were only expressing that one protein, that one BT protein, and I saw anywhere from 30 to 70 percent of the plants in those fields with corn borers in them, which we have never seen before. I mean, the only time you see corn borers in a corn plant is when it's non-BT, ever since BT corn came around. Um, anyway, so we saw that much injury at that time. We brought those, uh, we collected insects from those fields, brought them back here to the Ridgetown campus, and we have a lab where we can rear them out and do different um, diagnostic bioassays with them, exposing them to different concentrations of these BT proteins. And we found that those ones from Nova Scotia are in that Truro area, and also one that we picked up over in uh, the Annapolis Valley, were all highly resistant to Cry1F. Mm -hmm. So um, we've since been following up and testing them against the other proteins as well. So there are four pro proteins that work against European corn borer. Cry1AB is the oldest one that first came on the scene in 1996. And then Cry1F was the second one, I'd say late 90s. And then um, Monsanto at the time came out with a, a third and fourth that were always stuck together yeah. called Cry1A.105 and Cry2AB2. And uh, since we've picked up all of these, or we increased our monitoring, now we're starting to see some problems with the other proteins yeah. as well. So that's what happens with resistance. Hey, tell me, I mean, obviously you mentioned Eastern Canada, um, moving into Quebec, and you've, we've heard cases in Manitoba mm -hmm. as well. I'm not hearing Ontario or the big corn states yes. in the U.S. Why not? That's true. I, our hypothesis as to why this might have happened in these areas um, has to do with the fact that in, uh, in Ontario and maybe, you know, eastern Ontario and southern Quebec, we've been more similar in in our, you know, growing region to the Corn Belt in the U.S. So we've been getting a lot more options in terms of corn hybrids. And we went to uh, pyramids across the board where you have, like, hybrids that express at least two, maybe three of those different proteins mm -hmm. in the same plant. But I think in those smaller short-season markets, like the Maritimes region and Manitoba, they were not getting the same kind of options. And corn hybrids maybe getting some of the older genetics that were, they were still planting a lot of these single traits for a lot longer than the rest of us were. Right. And that's possibly what's contributed to this problem. We also don't know how much refuge was being planted out there. I mean, you know, in theory, they should have had 
When you have a single trait, you should still have a 20% structured refuge. But we know how much everyone loves doing that. And so we don't know how much that really was happening. No way to say one way or the other if it was there or not. But maybe that contributed to it. And then the last factor here is that we unfortunately never got a, an idea of the baseline susceptibility of the corn borer populations out east to these proteins, where we focused our efforts for monitoring for resistance in where we thought the greatest selection yeah. pressure would be, the big corn re growing regions, right? So we kind of neglected these areas, and maybe there was a little more to start with. Right. But anyway, it's, it's developed there now. So let's talk about um, how fast this could develop and spread, and with the fact that, as you said uh, in your presentation yesterday, it, a new protein may be 8 to 10 years away. Yeah, that's right. So with European corn borers, they move a lot, right? The adult is a moth. They, they, uh, they do overwinter in the corn stalks, way down low on the corn plant, but in the spring they fly out of the field and they look for um, grassy areas where the mating happens, and then they go lay their eggs in a different field. So it could spread, and, and those moths can fly up to 40 kilometers in one generation. And in some areas we have two generations per year. So there's potential there for this to spread unfortunately fairly right. quickly so let's talk about uh, what farmers and you know and, and agronomists can be doing um, in that meantime uh, what's on the top of the list I know Peter Johnson uh, the wheat specialist loves rotation and would love to see more growers growing wheat and expanding their rotations yeah well that wouldn't hurt in this case probably because I mean like I said crop just initial or you know looking at a, a small region of crop rotation within a field isn't probably going to make a huge difference because these moths move around so much hopefully we don't get into a scenario where the traits are all failing in a region and we have to tell people you shouldn't be growing corn here for a while to knock these corn borer populations back i hope we don't have to get to that point um but we're, we're encouraging growers right now to be really looking for this um, we're teaching them again today at Diagnostic Days what corn borers look like, the, all the different stages, because uh, a lot of the young people in agriculture have never even seen them in their career, right, because we've had BT corns uh, do so well. So we're teaching them about that, um, how to scout for them. We're increasing our um, monitoring using pheromone traps for the moss and trying to learn the timing of things that happen in different parts of Canada where we might not have n known so much about it. Um, and we're also thinking about maybe other things that they can do to control corn borers the old school way, not relying on the BT technology. If there are resistance issues in an area, we're really going to encourage um, stock destruction, like destroying that corn stubble in the fall, because we know those corn borers are really down low in the plant. They get under the combine head and they can survive over winter. But if you get really low and pulverize those corn stalks, that would ho hopefully kill a lot of them. Yeah. Insecticides are not an, an uh, not an awesome option with corn borer because they they uh, once they their uh, eggs are laid on the leaves they go into the midrib and into the plant really quickly. They're a borer. They don't feed a lot on the leaf tissue. They want to be inside the stalk. So timing insecticides is difficult. And we may consider uh, biological control as well. That's another mm -hmm. option that they do a lot of that in. Ki Excuse me, in Quebec for sweet corn, there are some parasitic wasps that we could release possibly that could help. Um, you know, reduce the population. Right. So, Well, Jocelyn, hey, a fascinating story, great research, great insights, and as I say, a story that we will be monitoring and following for, for years ahead. Thanks for stopping by and taking the time for to join us on Corn School. You're very welcome. Glad you came.